Welcome to another week of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Speaker Series. We meet every Monday of the academic year in this room at this time, um, except for next Monday when it's a holiday and we won't be here. So, um, But I'm going to give you a preview of the next couple of speakers after that before introducing today's speaker. Also, there's a sign-in sheet going around. If you haven't already signed it, please do. That helps us keep track of um, how many people are here for our sponsors and others. Okay, so on February 25th, the Monday after next, Josh Snodgrass is coming from the University of Oregon, and his talk is entitled Life History Trade-Offs Between Childhood Growth and Immune Function Among Shuar Forager Horticulturalists of Amazonian Ecuador. And the following Monday, March 4th, Dan Hershka is going to be here from Arizona State with a talk entitled What Does It Mean to Replicate Studies in Cultural Species? And so that's some exciting what's coming up. You can look on the website for a full list of the speakers for the rest of the quarter. And I'm very happy to introduce Melanie Martin, who is coming to us from the University of Washington, talking about human infant feeding, evolved strategies, individual optima, and public health. Thank you, and thank you, Brooke, for inviting me. I am particularly happy to be here in LA, coming from Seattle, because if you've seen the weather, we're having a Pacific Northwest snow apocalypse uh, right now. Um, so my, uh, my husband, who is snowed in with our two children for like the ninth day in a row, is not so happy that I'm here, but I am happy to take advantage of it. Um, and then, so, I also want to say that I did my PhD at UC Santa Barbara, so it's nice to be here and see so many familiar faces from many years of going to 3UC. Uh, I never did get to go come to the campus before, so I'm particularly excited to be here. Uh, before I get into my talk, I want to front load my talk a little bit with kind of a disclaimer that some of the research that I'm going to review and the conclusions that I draw from it um, some people might take issue with it, maybe less so in this room, uh, but I don't know about anybody potentially watching this at a later date. Uh, and that's because I am talking about in infant feeding. And when you talk about infant feeding, you're also talking about breastfeeding. And if there is one thing that I have learned as a breastfeeding mother and a researcher, it is that it is impossible to talk about breastfeeding in this country without delving right into the mommy wars, which are waged online and in media and among academic scholars too. And these debates and the entrenched positions that people take in them have affected me personally and professionally. Uh, so I'm just acknowledging that I'm going to start off with some main points uh, and ask that anybody who has some objections just keeps an open mind and we can hopefully have a more fruitful discussion or debate at the end of the talk. So the main points that I'm going to cover here uh, are first reviewing evidence in arguing that flexible mixed feeding is part of an evolved human niche. I'll then discuss how, how flexible mixed feeding Oops, yeah. How flexible mixed feeding trajectories are expected to be individually optimized to maternal trade offs and infant energetic needs. Um, given both maternal time and energetic constraints, reproductive trade offs, and individual variation in lactational output and infant growth uh, trajectories. So I'll, prevent, I'll present some of my previous research with the Chimane and Chimane infant feeding practices in talking about this um, and, and arguing that in some contexts, early mixed feeding may benefit infants uh, with minimal risks to their health, health and without undermining long-term breastfeeding practices. And it's this latter conclusion uh, that the outset um, people might have issues with because it would appear to contradict current public health recommendations. Um, and I'm going to argue that a more that the population-based recommendations, which are vital to implementing policies that improve family health, can coexist with more biologically grounded models of mixed feeding trajectories, um, and ultimately uh, promote long-term breastfeeding and help families to negotiate their own individual optima. 
So to define what those current recommendations are, so we're all on the same page, uh, these are the recommendations in place since 2002 from the World Health Organization. They include initiating breastfeeding within one hour after birth, exclusive breastfeeding for six months, which means no formula, solid foods, or other liquids, and then continued breastfeeding with complementary feeding for two years or more. And these recommendations are largely based on epidemiological evidence of lowered infectious disease risks and growth patterns of breastfed infants under optimal conditions. Now, in the past couple decades, more research has accumulated indicating that there are um, lowered long-term health risks for both mothers and infants that are breastfeeding more or less according to these guidelines, um, but they, they weren't originally part of uh, what the, the WHO stipulated in, in making these guidelines. <clears throat> so how I'm using the term mixed feeding in this talk differs a little bit from that terminology. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Um, and related to the epidemiological risks then are two main ideas and lines of evidence that one, early complementary feeding is potentially dangerous because it can always introduce pathogens to infants who have vulnerable immune systems, um, but also that it can offset breast milk intake. And this is because breast milk production occurs on this positive feedback loop whereby infant succulent infant suckling stimulates breast milk production. So an infant that's getting a bottle of formula or any other food is gonna fill up on that and start to breastfeed less frequently. Over time, breast milk output is going to decrease and then that can ultimately lead to suboptimal nutrition and earlier than optimal weaning because more moms would then have to supplement more and more complementary feeding to make up for the loss in breast milk production. Okay, so now how I'm using mixed feeding is just to refer to breastfeeding combined with any food or liquid other than human milk at any period of lactation that is not exclusive breastfeeding. And this is just to differentiate from the WHO terminology of complementary feeding, which is supposed to be reserved specifically to denote appropriate infant feeding that begins after six months, after six months of exclusive breastfeeding. So the definition that I'm using is more in line uh, with what previous anthropologists have stressed as a gradual weaning process in humans uh, and in other primates in particular. Um, so it's also been termed as the weaning trajectory or transitional feeding in which weaning starts with the introduction of other foods but occurs over a long period of time um, and gradually escalates towards energy independence and independent foraging. Um, so this is a definition that also allows us to compare breast, to compare feeding trajectories um, for across species because mixed feeding for any species then is just defined as the second period of lactation. And when we compare mixed feeding across mammals, as Langer did in this 2003 paper, some interesting patterns emerge. The first being that mixed feeding is the predominant phase of lactation for the majority of animals. So he surveyed data from 168 different species or, um, and noted that mixed feeding compromised more than 60% of total lactation time in 70% of the species that he surveyed. So really total lactation time is extended by extending the mixed, the mixed feeding period um, and that was also largely related to body size. So Langer observed that only when lactation spans were less than 100 days do, did mixed feeding periods typically account for more than 50% of total lactation duration. And this is the case that we see with very small animals like mice um, who have a total lactation period of 24 days and their mixed, mixed feeding period is less than half of that total duration. <clears throat> now, dietary quality was a third dimension that Langer noted, though, so that with lower dietary quality, which was defined as high fiber content, that appeared to promote generally longer mixed feeding durations. Um, this is an example with the capybara, and Langer argues that in this case, earlier supplementation and a longer mixed feeding 
duration may promote microbial and gastrointestinal differentiation to, necessary to maximize energy from more high fiber foods. Now, when you get to larger mammals, you can see both of these patterns taking place. So for example, with sheep and the um, human and great ape species that he observed, you see total breastfeeding, total lactation durations greater than 100 days, uh, also coinciding with body size, but that the mixed feeding duration for hominids is a little bit shorter than in sheep, likely related to our higher dietary quality and higher dietary quality of those mixed foods. So Langer also observed that regardless of the ratio of milk, of the milk only period to the mixed feeding period, most species began their first solid feeding within 10 to 100 days. Key exceptions to that rule were the great apes, gibbons, elephants, and toothed whales who all had milk only periods greater than 100 days. Um, and, those, and those then are indicative of very large mammals that also have very extended mother-infant periods. Um, but notably for humans, um, among the great apes, humans begin mixed feeding about six months earlier and wean about one to three years earlier than would be expected for their body size as great apes. And this is though interesting because um, we also have more, we have secondarily attritional infants who have longer developmental periods um, and higher uh, dependent needs. And so that difference is related to a whole suite of other derived human traits. The first of which is the fact that humans directly provision their offspring and other uh, great apes do not. So other great apes exhibit what's called passive transfer um, in which they are foraging with their offspring, but they eat really sloppily, and so a lot of food just falls down on them, and they will tolerate their offspring reaching up and grabbing it out of their mouths or off their fur. Um, passive transfer, in, in this paper from Yegi and Van Shake, uh, they examined this across species and linked passive transfer to increasing dietary complexity and extractive foraging. Um, and argued that, in fact, it may be more important in facilitating learning than actually supplementing offspring nutrition. Direct provisioning does directly benefit offspring tradition, so it's a significant energy contrib contribution to um, offspring, and that is only observed in marmosets, humans, and tamarins among, among the apes. So these are obviously distantly related species of primates, but they're also species that exhibit intensive biparental care, cooperative breeding, food sharing, and relatively short interbirth intervals. So this is then where I argue that for humans, mixed feeding occupies a niche of interrelated co-evolved traits, which include direct provisioning and food sharing, higher quality diets, parental care, and cooperative breeding, and those then facilitate uh, earlier postpartum fecundity for the mothers, shorter interbirth intervals, and then ultimately higher fertility and overlapping generations that feed back into all of that. <clears throat> now, because current lactation represents constraints on future, reproduc on future reproduction for mothers, across species, maternal reproductive success favors offspring transitioning to mixed feeding as early as possible. And this then sets up the possibility of maternal offspring conflict within species. And this is a framework that anthropologists have applied directly to examining weaning conflicts in humans. So in this model, um, this is a figure from a Tully and Ball paper from 2013, Infants uniformly gain the most from uh, intensive breastfeeding for as long as possible, but in intensive breastfeeding is energetically costly to mothers. And this is because of both the ovulatory suppressive effects, suppressive effects of intensive breastfeeding, uh, which limit their future reproductive opportunities, but also because of the time spent breastfeeding that can't be directed to other fitness enhancing activities. So at some point, the cost to moms will outweigh the benefits to infants, and that would predict uh, a switch in reducing breastfeeding intensity. So this was the framework that I applied in doing my dissertation research with the Chimani. 
<clears throat> uh, the Chimane are indigenous forager horticulturalists in the Bolivian Amazon. They're a population of about 15,000 scattered across 80 to 100 um, villages of size, ranging, ranging from about 50 to 250. And they've been studied extensively uh, by the Chimane Health and Life History Project since about 2002. Uh, so for me, what was of interest in working with the Chimane is that they are what we would characterize as an intensive breastfeeding population. So they breastfeed infants on demand, carrying their babies around in these slings. Uh, they co-sleep with them at night, so they get on demand 24 hours a day. They don't use bottles or formula feeding. Um, there's also no ritualized taboos or customs that govern when or what complementary foods are introduced. So mothers' feeding decisions are highly individualized. They're also very well nourished. We don't see signs of malnourishment and moms, and it's a high fertility population. So average birth, total fertility rate is nine births per, per woman. And at the same time, it's also a high mortality population with infant mortality rates ranging from about 10 to 20 percent. And we see systematic early growth faltering in infancy and early childhood. And then of key interest to me there was that despite being a, exhibiting intensive breastfeeding that goes on for two to three years, generally until women get pregnant again, they tend to start introducing liquids pretty early, liquids and stem solids. So exclusive breastfeeding durations range from zero to six months and at an average of about four months. So I then was interested in um, looking specifically at the question of whether that early mixed feeding mediated quantity quality trade-offs. And I predicted that I would see um, growth and health costs for infants and energy savings for the moms in terms of earlier resumption of postpartum memses. Okay, and to look at this, I did a mixed longitudinal study between 2012-2013 with about 160 dyads, infants age up to 35 months, and collected maternal interviews, dietary recall, anthropometrics, and focal follows. So in investigating the question, the first thing I did was actually ask moms when they started introducing foods and why, liquids and solids. Um, and this was an open-ended question, but I grouped these according to categories as to whether they were generally infant-centric or maternal-centric. And the overwhelming majority, so those in blue, about 64% total, reflected these more infant-centric needs that moms appeared to be responding to infant cues of hunger or growth. Um, there was another category that was like, oh, I don't know why, or somebody else gave them food. But of those infants that would be more maternal centric, I'm sorry, the reasons that would be more maternal centric, they related to maternal illness or moms reporting that they didn't have enough milk. So key here being that no moms, ex while some moms expressed physical constraints, none of them mentioned time or energetic constraints. Um, and I don't think that this is because Chimani moms wouldn't conceive of these. Because when you ask, when I've asked other moms why they weaned their infants, I get my favorite response I've ever had, which is cari, which translates to Spanish as cuesta, which means literally it costs. It's expensive. So they absolutely recognize the energetic demands of breastfeeding, but it's not feeding in to these earlier transitions. In looking at whether their infants were paying a cost for this earlier transitioning, I looked at um, a few aspects. This is an example looking at height for age. Uh, this was a, <clears throat> a mixed longitudinal sample of 156 infants and 287 observations. This is a linear effects model adjusting for child age. Just to point out that um, in this forest plot, the two different bars that is height for age is calculated from the World Health Organization growth references and from our own very robust sample of Chimane LMS growth references. Um, so I looked at exclusive breastfeeding duration um, earlier than the mean and later than the mean and adjusted for maternal height, infant sex, and infant age. And what we see is that infants that actually started 
uh, complementary feeding earlier who had shorter exclusive breastfeeding durations actually had higher height for HZ scores. So no costs in terms of growth there. And this can reflect two things. One, which is really common in the literature, is uh, suspected that it's reverse causality, whereby faster growing kids are perceived or need more food earlier, so they're introduced foods earlier. And the second possibility that I'll mention in a bit might be that Chimani moms are able to uh, supplant without supplementing breast milk intake, so the additional liquids and foods they get are, are purely additive and might actually be promoting growth. So other ways that I looked at it showed in, in no way, shape, or form that I looked at this did there appear to be any evidence of infant costs associated with earlier feeding or maternal benefits. So infants that had shorter exclusive breastfeeding durations didn't have a greater risk of uh, gastrointestinal or respiratory systems. They weren't more likely to wean earlier. Um, I didn't see a lower frequency or shorter durations of breastfeeding bouts in behavioral observations. Uh, exclusive breastfeeding duration wasn't related to maternal postpartum BMI or resumption of menstruation. So, uh, in a w so while this was um, at first a little bit frustrating as a grad student, I also had to step back and think about what I had been observing and what moms had been telling me. Um, and I really th seemed, it seemed to me to make sense that the pattern that I observed with them of this very gradual feeding coupled with continuous, still very intensive breastfeeding didn't fit that framework of either maternal trade-offs or the current public health framework in which any early feeding can undermine long-term breastfeeding. And that led me to start really questioning when does earlier mixed feeding compromise breastfeeding and infant health outcomes? So this is the, well, I'm gonna go through what I see as sort of the standard framework for epidemiological research in breastfeeding and infant health outcomes. Um, feeding practices are categorized in these very static uniform categories. You're either exclusively breastfeeding or you're breastfeeding or you're not breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is always, is usually conceived as a protective independent variable. So the baseline is maybe formula feeding and then the outcome is measured as how breastfeeding protects or promotes something. Um, <clears throat> there are, the, the risk factors for optimal feeding are usually envisioned in, in terms of, or, or social structural factors that can constrain breastfeeding practices are emphasized over individual needs and decisions. There also tends to be an emphasis on really long-term multifactorial outcomes like obesity risk, uh, IQ, um, along with some more acute measures of infectious disease risk. Um, within that though, the bio, while those relate to theoretically plausible ways that breastfeeding and other feeding practices can influence those outcomes, the actual biological mechanisms tend to get black boxed in the research. And then importantly, the, the models are really uh, conceive of breastfeeding as a proxy for breast milk and that benefits are considered or explicitly modeled as independent of breastfeeding behavior and other confounding factors that influence those behaviors. So what I argue is that when we really want to consider um, when we expect earlier mixed feeding to compromise either long-term breastfeeding duration or infant health outcomes, we have to consider this whole suite of interrelated factors. So the total ecology in which breastfeeding and other infant feeding practices are occurring, maternal intentions when they transition across uh, any change in feeding behaviors, the disease ecology, and then the intensity and quality of mixed feeding or complementary foods. So I'm gonna illustrate a few examples of how these can all differently interact to influence breastfeeding and infant health outcomes. So the first example would be what I see in history and, and in many populations too still today, where you see the clearest risk 
is when you have breastfeeding as a, an undervalued um, practice, and that's coupled with really rapid intentional weeding in a high pathogen environment and in which weaning foods are of pretty poor quality, either nutritionally or the fact that they introduce a lot of pathogens. So we see this uh, historically in some interesting cases, like in Iceland between the 17th and 18th century. Uh, Iceland had really, really high infant mortality rates relative to the rest of Europe. So you can see uh, infant mortality rates in some years were more than double. Uh, Iceland, as they were in England and Wales, Denmark and Norway, approaching you know, 350 deaths out of 1,000. <clears throat> and this was, at the time, um, pretty openly recognized by physicians and reformers uh, as it being attributed to the, the widespread practice of very early weaning with cow's milk or, or cream. And, in, and they, were, they were investigating this particularly because infant mortality was so high that the whole population was in decline, despite the fact that fertility was really high. Um, they saw that most families were actually only had two to three offspring that make, made it to, um, say, adolescence. So cow's milk was really highly valued uh, to the point that breastfeeding was really devalued and across social classes, infants were breastfed only for about eight days and then weaned to cow's milk or cream for families that could afford it, um, res resulting with some um, observers at the time noting that it was really the poorest infants who had the, breast, the best outcomes, the best likelihood of survival because their mothers could not afford cow milk and breastfed longer. And interestingly, those same observers would note at the time that Icelanders didn't make this connection at all. For 300 years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and at about the, around the early 1900s, um, medical, early medical accounts, you see accounts of physicians explicitly um, kind of encouraging women to breastfeed. So there's a similar kind of history played out though in the US between the 19th and 20th century when we started seeing massive declines in breastfeeding initiation and duration. And this relates to um, what were preferences for artificial feeding connected to ideas about classism and also the primacy of science and you know, man's domination over nature, um, but also a lot out of necessity as more and more women were participating in industrialized labor and just couldn't be around their infants frequently enough to nurse. So <clears throat> at the, this also produced a marked rise in infant morbidity and mortality, not to the extent that we saw in Iceland, um, but enough that it actually gave rise to pediatric medicine. This is what pediatric medicine has its origins in, um, as well as the, the birth of feeding recommendations and breastfeeding promotion. Um, this book, uh, the cover of it is actually referencing a public health campaign in the early 1900s that was encouraging women to breastfeed rather than give cow milk. And so incidentally, incidentally what's also interesting, go back, sorry. Um, this is where we also see formula start to come about from a place of really good intentions because women were relying, families were relying on say unpasteurized cow milk and these other homemade concoctions that were unsanitary or not nutritionally sufficient. So the idea of a scientific formula that could replace those um, poor uh, artificial milks or replacements was born of that necessity. So where I think we see the risk of how early mixed feeding translates to better or worse outcomes, where that risk is not so clear, though, is in populations more like the Chimani, where you have intensive breastfeeding and gradual weaning, uh, but also it's occurring in a high pathogen environment and it's really indeterminate in terms of what the risks are and what the intensity of um, early weaning foods given is. So we saw this with the Chimani, but it is also very common when we look at other uh, non-industrialized populations, um, particularly in recent history. So the best example of which 
uh, was a review of the ethnographic literature looking at the human relations area files that Selen did in 2001. So he found 43 uh, ethnographic accounts in which there was some information about um, age at first solid or liquid food introduction and age at weaning. He noted that across those populations, the modal age of solid food introduction was six months and the modal age of weaning was 30 months. So this certainly maps on to the, the age-based recommendations, but there's a lot of variation in those modes. So when you break it down, um, liquids were introduced anywhere between zero and 12 months. Um, and in 75%, a total of 75% of the populations, liquids were introduced between birth and three months. Uh, solids were introduced between birth and three months in about 40% of the populations. And again, these were ethnographic accounts from the early to mid 20th century. So these were infants that they weren't being fed infant formula um, and they were generally weaned around two or three years of age. So it's more evidence that early mixed feeding can be compatible with long-term breastfeeding. Uh, what we don't know uh, are what the costs or risks of that would have been to infants. And so here I would argue that we also have to consider, um, rather than approaching this from assuming that all feeding is costly, we also have to keep in mind that moms and babies are not uniform, that babies are also not closed systems, they're growing, and maternal lactational output, milk composition varies, size for age varies, and infant growth trajectories vary. So it's possible um, in where introducing foods early may be either minimally risky or even beneficial, I would argue, uh, is first in some environments, um, this is something that yet to be tested, but that pathogen exposure can be introduced through complementary foods, but it might be so minimal relative to the general risks of everything else that babies are coming into contact with um, that it's really not additively increasing the risk or certainly moms are not gonna notice it relative to all the other kind of dangers in the environment. I think it's also possible, particularly with, with the Chimani, um, that early feeding is maybe, is just not energetically sufficient enough to supplant breastfeeding. So it might just supplement breastfeeding. They're not using bottles to replace a bout of feeding. They're just giving little bits of liquid and uh, food or soup or chicha um, while continuing constant, constant breastfeeding. <clears throat> um, and then there's also the possibility that that mode of being able to uh, additively increase infant energy intakes has a buffering effect. Um, so the complementary foods might be directly promoting growth. And at the same time, while you have continued intensive breastfeeding, uh, because of the immunoprotective factors in breast milk, maybe you are buffering against any additive risk of pathogen exposure. And so this more you know, complex scenario is something that I think has to be more explicitly taken, taken into account and modeled. Um, and, and here I'm going to present another example from my research uh, showing where not considering that leads to um, just bad, bad models. So <laughs> rather than critique somebody else's work. So this is work that was done with the uh, COM uh, also known as the Toba in Argentina. So this is the Gran Chaco region of Argentina um, bordering Paraguay. Uh, this work was done with my collaborator, who I did, uh, Claudia Valesia, who I previously did a postdoc with and am now collaborating with her on this project, the Chaco Area Reproductive Ecology Program. So the Colm were traditionally hunter-gatherers. Um, most of them, because of various uh, because of environmental degradation and government policies have been forced out of their traditional mode of subsistence, um, uh, except for a few more rural populations in Western Com. The Eastern Com, who live just outside of the capital city of Formosa in the Formosa province, 
Um, they are living in peri-urban barrios right outside of the city. So they don't, they don't have any connection to their traditional subsistence lifestyle anymore. They live in government subsidized housing. They have um, clean water and electricity provided for them and government subsist sub subsidies to buy food but no longer forage for their own, for their own food. Um, their economic opportunities for advancement are, are very, very limited. Um, that said, and then on top of that, so they're, they're much more market integrated in, types of, in terms of their diet, which is mostly fry bread and then other food items that they can buy with the subsidies. Um, they also have, while it's not a very hygienic environment, they have, uh, they, there's a medical clinic in community that they have access to and free medical care. They give birth in a hospital in town. Um, births have become very medicalized in the last couple decades to the point that the cesarean birth rate is about 50%, which is really high. Um, despite that though, moms still typically universally breastfeed and intensively breastfeed. So uh, childcare has not changed much in that Infants are still given constant care and contact with their moms, and then around the age three or so, they're kind of free to, to roam around. Um, calm moms do use, will bottle feed, um, usually with powdered milk and sometimes formula when they, they get access to it. Okay, so for data that, was, that we looked at with this project, uh, was collected as part of the Life History Transitions Project in 2011-2015 uh, in this one particular urban community. Uh, it, it cons it, we, or the researchers, the field researchers, um, surveyed, uh, recruited 101 infants before the age of one, and then did monthly observations and collected anthropometric measures and interviews with them until um, about six months after weaning. So, this work came out of the question uh, related to the cesarean births and whether cesarean births were associated with illness risk after adjusting for other nutritional and gestational factors. So our logic here being that um, because of the disruption of the, microbi the microbiome uh, and also confounding factors that increase cesarean birth risk in the first place, like premature birth, um, young maternal age, previous cesarean birth, um, trying to separate out what was really an effect of cesarean birth versus the confounding factors. So I uh, included first as in a, in a model, in an additive model, the risk uh, or not breastfeeding and wait for age z-score as independent current nutritional risk factors. Um, the logic of including not breastfeeding being that this is still a pretty high pathogen unsanitary environment. There's no plumbing, for example, in any homes, um, and there's lots of uh, zoonotic exposure with stray dogs and chickens running around. So removing breastfeeding at all, I predicted, would still increase uh, illness symptoms, so increase disease risk because of the loss of protection from breast milk. Um, we also then considered the effects of gestational age below 39 weeks, so preterm and early term births, and adolescent moms and older moms who would have been more likely to have repeat cesareans. And so modeling these first then, we examined uh, if cesarean delivery independently predicted uh, GI risk or respiratory illness risk, and if it moderated any of those other confounding factors. And, uh, it did not. <laughs> and also, we unexpectedly observed that not breastfeeding, uh, greater weight for HZ score, and early and preterm births were associated with lower risks of gastrointestinal disease and respiratory illness. So there's no real biologically plausible way that not breastfeeding would be directly protect protective, and certainly no way I think that early term or preterm births would be protective against disease risk. Um, and I, I realized then in, in looking at that data that I had not sufficiently considered um, 
how birth conditions interact with growth and early mixed feeder, earlier mixed feeding and potentially fat buffering against pathogen risk. I think partly because I was so myopically fixated on what I expect to be negative effects associated with weaning. So I not only wasn't considering reverse causality, but the fact that when you have rapid growth and rapid ad adiposity, that's actually protective against uh, gastrointestinal illness or perhaps the severity of illness that mothers would perceive and report. So that's one example of when I think the risks are not so clear and need to be better modeled. And I want to close by suggesting that in our own population, the risks are also not so clear. When we have all of these other varying kind of intersecting ecologies, where we have the case in which breastfeeding is, is still not structurally supported, for a number of women, or it's variably structurally supported. Maternal intentions vary. Uh, we have a low pathogen risk, but also high chronic disease risk. And while our weaning foods are unlikely to introduce pathogens, we also potentially have more obesogenic weaning foods that are intersecting with chronic disease risk in this whole other new way. So this brings me to some critiques of this standard epidemiological framework in which breastfeeding research, I think, generally occurs. Um, first, in pointing out that the age delineations, right, so exclusive breastfeeding up to six months and then breastfeeding thereafter, those are, of course, social constructs. They're not, they're epidemiological and statistical constructs. There's no biological basis to anything about six months. Um, that said, well, I think those are important in how we necessarily have to study and conduct population-based research because they don't reflect individual biology. We have to reconsider uh, how, bio or how policy and policy based on these population observations can coexist with individual needs. And I'll give as an example here why I don't, I don't think that's so crazy to talk about. If a 37-year-old woman um, goes to her doctor because she feels a lump in her breast, uh, her doctor's not going to say, no, really, it's fine because only women aged 45 and up should get mammograms. You don't need a mammogram. Right? An OBGYN would never say that. They would look at her individual case study and uh, individual risk. Conversely, we know, for example, that not, like shell nuts and peanuts are a great source of protein and healthy and omega fatty acids. We also know that many people are allergic to nuts. This doesn't prevent us from saying that nuts are a healthy, good snack for most people, and we wouldn't also force anybody who's allergic to nuts to eat nuts. And I, I think I'm, I'm putting this up as an example of when when we don't focus on this individual variation, how it unfortunately creates a lot of mixed messaging. And it's not where we continually do research that isn't benefiting uh, research that a lot of moms in this country need. So this is an example of a, a mom Facebook group that I'm on, uh, a mother reaching out to help because her baby had jaundice uh, and she had to start supplementing with formula early and she wanted to know how to how she could can you continue to keep up her supply despite uh, supplementing with formula and specifically says I know there are lots of breastfeeding resources online but they're all making me feel horrible about pumping and supplementing this early so I tried to avoid them I think that that's absurd that we're not able to um, access that information without, or that any woman isn't able to access that information without shame. Uh, and also that that research doesn't even exist out there because we just keep myopically focusing on the benefits of exclusive breastfeeding for six months and not how mixed feeding can coexist within these larger frameworks of uh, infant needs and long-term breastfeeding. Uh, another critique of the standard framework is that uh, the associated benefits then are easily confounded with intention and other confounding factors. 
Uh, we particularly see this in terms of education, socioeconomic status, um, and, and all the ways that certain women, more privileged women in our population, have access to breastfeeding resources, while other women do not. <clears throat> and then the focus on long-term outcomes, rather than uh, more immediate biological interactions between breastfeeding and uh, various systems like the immune system or metabolic system, um, relates to all this research that's really easily undermined by anecdote and equivocal evidence. Uh, I also will say that I think there's a way to conceive of breastfeeding, not just as a protective function of breast milk, but considering what happens when you remove breast milk completely, if that's another signal to the infant in and of itself about how it might need to ramp up energy extraction and saving, considering that we would have evolved with continuous input from breastfeeding up to about two years or more of life. And then beyond that, the addition of any non-milk liquid or solid might have its own separate effects above and beyond either the protective function of breastfeeding and removal of breast milk. And so then what you get in scholarly research and media is uh, you get cases of uh, researchers who are attacked from researchers who promote the orthodoxy when they do any research that challenges the prevailing public framework or orthodoxy. So in the case of this study uh, from Raison, they argued that a mother's socioeconomic advantage, which was measured through her intention to breastfeed, uh, was actually associated with the same health benefits for the baby as actual breastfeeding. And that's what they were able to tease apart in, in their study, uh, and that study was just widely attacked immediately for challenging the, the orthodoxy of the benefits of breastfeeding. And then that gets picked up by other sources in the media, though, as evidence that the benefits of breastfeeding are over-exaggerated to support a whole other agenda. So in closing, I just want to stress that I think that there are these other unresolved questions um, that are important and interesting biologically and also can be more helpful for breastfeeding women today um, in our culture and others. And that is asking how a continuum of exclusive breastfeeding to mixed feeding functionally interacts with immune, metabolic, and cognitive development from birth and up to two years, shifting the focus from the first six months to a whole mixed feeding trajectory, which is the, should be the largest part of breastfeeding in our species and many other species. This, by the way, is my son at nine months uh, eating a bag of oyster crackers. And secondly, using that information to develop uh, a kind of range of guidelines that don't have to challenge policy but can be important for individual families um, in understanding what minimum ratios of breastfeeding to complementary feeding might give the maximum return and under what circumstances, and most importantly then, how mothers can maintain the optimal minimums uh, for their own children in the context of their own lives. So this is my biological framework for the breastfeeding research that I would like to see done moving forward, starting with the fact that breastfeeding is the biological null model. It's not something protective relative to uh, formula feeding. Feeding trajectories should be conceived of as fluid and individualized. Uh, outcomes that we measure uh, can be current biological responses rather than long-term multifactorial outcomes which are really difficult to parse in terms of how they're causally related to different mixed feeding trajectories. And understanding that milk and complementary foods, breast milk and complementary foods, functionally interact with and may signal to different biological systems. And so our predictions for any outcome should be expected to vary with the intentions of, of a mom in switching from one mode of feeding to another, um, changing breastfeeding intensity, changing uh, 
the intensity or quality of certain complementary foods and what the particular biological outcome of interest is. And that is it. I will close by just saying thank you to the funding sources um, for both the Chimani Health and Life History Project, my dissertation research, the CARE Project, all of the field researchers and staff uh, involved in the Chimani Project, CARE Project, my own Chimani research team, uh, my collaborators, Michael Garvin, Hillard Kaplan, Aaron Blackwell, Claudia Valencia, and Amanda Vale, who all collaborated on uh, aspects of the research I presented today, and input I've gotten over the years uh, from the UCSB Evolutionary Anthro Lab and the Yale Reproductive Ecology Lab. Thank you. Molly. Um, first, thank you for such an interesting talk, and um, I think we're really lucky to have you come and share this work because it's a very seamless integration of evolutionary theory and then public health implications. I, I thought it was really great. So, um, the only thing that I was uh, that initially going to bring up was the observation that I think you you saw um, higher uh, disease risk or infection rate or something in babies that actually had the continued breastfeeding with the supplement, with the, with the mixed feeding model, where you had the question mark pop up? With the colon, they, so yeah. babies who were not breastfeeding, so had already been weaned mm -hmm. up to, so, and this was a, um, adjusting for infant age, yeah, infant lower. age group, they had lower disease risk. So that's like, the only thing <coughs> that stuck out to me because it's consistent with what you see in the HIV breastfeeding literature, which has its own suite of, you know, shaming and judgments, and it has its own whole interesting social context too. And, um, and you, like my understanding from this, and it's a little outside of my area, but it's like kind of that when you have um, breast milk that contains any sort of either bacterial or viral uh, pathogen that when you um, have exclusive breastfeeding there's like relatively low chance of infection depending on the mm -hmm. pathogen um, and that obviously no breastfeeding is, is no risk and that um, mixed feeding at times can cause some irritation to like the epithelial um, uh, lining of the, of the baby's intestines that actually allows breast milk pathogens to get mm -hmm. into the baby's system so it would that kind of infection rate is like totally consistent with the idea that um, w with your results that like um, yeah. actually deprivation of breast milk is protective or especially in the context of mixed feeding which I always found very interesting and I don't know exactly what you know the sort of origin of like uh, of disease rates in this population are. You said it was a low pathogen population, but I don't I mean, it's, it's still, we don't have good surveys of disease rates, so these were all reported symptoms, yeah. monthly reported symptoms, um, but certainly just knowing their environment, there is, I think, a high risk of transmission mm -hmm. from, like I said, zoonotic exposure and just general unhygienic living conditions. Yeah. and. Um, and so that type of environmental exposures. But I think that's a good point and something that I hadn't considered and might go into uh, also perceptions. So when, when I say not breastfeeding, I mean, those were infants, because this is a still gra mostly gradual weaning population, the cumulative incidence of, of uh, not breastfeeding before one year was, on, was less than 10%. So the overwhelming majority of infants are still breastfeeding up to at least a year. But when we start to see them not breastfeeding, they would have been on some trajectory of declining breastfeeding. And maybe, you know, so that could be sped up by energetic needs is, was what I was interpreting it as, but it could also be um, something more related to, well, as I'm still, when, when a baby's just getting, you know, non-breast milk, they seem to be doing better. I don't know. It's, it is maybe possible. Very interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, I guess you know, given that it seems like the the public discourse the public discourse tends to move towards kind of you know opposing polls or something. You know, how, how do you think that 
that scientists should communicate nuance and complexity in, in these kinds of systems? And you know, is there a, a way to kind of um, you know effectively communicate with the public that can, that, that 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 more complex picture? Yeah, I, I mean, I think part of it is um, can, I, if you are research that is going to publish anything that would get picked up by the public, you have to be on top of it and know what the what the messaging can be and try to, I guess, you know, get your story story out first. Um, I was uh, recently um, some other colleagues and I. Uh, talked about this in a, a blog post for a lactation blog because there had been a story for uh, um, looking at pumped milk and how weight gain in infants that were given pumped express milk was their weight gain was still higher than breastfeeding at the breast but not as high as if they were given formula in a bottle um, and so the way that that story that we read it as as it was interpreted in the media is like, well, yeah, just breastfeeding at the breast is always going to be better. But there are other considerations, like how bottle feeding is affecting that. That has nothing to do, probably, with whether it's formula or express breast milk. And so acknowledging that first offhand, that you know, bottle feeding is a modifiable factor uh, and that moms who are pumping, that is part of their strategy right now to maintain long-term breastfeeding. So it's not to say don't do any research that might have negative implications for pumping moms, but be upfront about, okay, what are the benefits of you know, expressing breast milk and continuing long-term breastfeeding would be one example maybe. It's, it's unfortunately, I think, something, something <coughs> difficult. We don't live in a society that encourages nuanced discussion about anything. So, um, I, yeah, I don't have uh, a, a concrete way of going about this. I just think it's something that more has to be acknowledged and, and talked about. There's uh, a campaign called Fed is Best that comes, out, comes from uh, other observations and experiences that um, clinicians have had with um, neonatal infants who are jaundiced or aren't getting enough. Um, they're not getting enough calories, they're not getting enough nutrients, um, they're not getting enough glucose uh, because they're being exclusively breastfed. And I think the, the issue there um, and why I didn't even bring it up is that while that might certainly happen and is important to research, the, the whole campaign that has come up about it is like, well, let's overthrow the whole message now and say Fed is best. And like, it doesn't have to go back and forth constantly between one camp and another. There can be promotion and policy and also more under, nuanced understanding between clinicians and nurse practitioners, um, and that needs to get out to the public. Yeah. Um, so I, I think this goes a little bit off of what you were saying, but I'm thinking about that, the six month recommendation again. <coughs> and I, I'm going to quibble a little bit with the, the analysis, but your understanding of this is better than mine, but that, that, that there's no, that it's, it's purely a, a social um, construct to say six months, because presumably the reason that they landed on six months had something to do with needs that the infant has at some point that can't be satisfied with breast milk alone. Mm -hmm. right? and so what I'm wondering is in thinking about how to how to have more nuanced recommendations that at least maybe could apply at the local level is what you know about um, how what the major factors are that influence that that tipping point mm -hmm. or the the benefits of uh, complementary foods outweigh the benefits of being exclusively breastfed, like is it iron, is it protein, what is the thing, and then if we know something about the local diet and what the local yeah. complementary foods are going to be, does that then change the timeline for when the kind of local optimal would be for 
Yeah, so a, a couple things is so not built into the recommendations explicitly when they were considering epidemiological evidence, but certainly there is a biological understanding of um, you can look at different aspects of um, digestive development and physiology and motor skill development. And there's a lot of things that come on board around six months. But again, it's more, I mean, it's more of a, an average, you know, expect variation, but certainly around six months would probably be observed. In terms of <clears throat> the, 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 the main idea being, okay, breast milk is sufficient to supply infant energy with everything they need up to about six months, I think it is important to stress that that is coming from observations of growth in optimal conditions. So those were not infants that were exposed to a lot of high pathogen, and those are families that are very well nourished. So I think it opens up the possibility, um, and, and I'm not the first to say this, so this was a, an early critique of the whole weanlings dilemma, uh, is that in very high pathogen environments when infants are continuously exposed to gastrointestinal and respiratory illnesses, that takes a huge energetic toll on them to the point that their growth might never able, might not ever able be to be sustained by exclusive breastfeeding um, very early on because they need constant like re, re upping of that of their caloric inputs. Um, and I think, you know, relatedly might say, look at, you know, there's not a link between maternal body composition and macronutrient composition of milk, but there are certainly some micronutrient factors in milk which are very variable given maternal diet. Um, and we can say that under these optimal conditions on average, yes, iron is, starts to deplete after six months, as does vitamin A, but in more stressed environments, iron, maternal iron might auto automatically, or sorry, might already be very, very low. Um, vitamin A could also be very low. And, you know, how those are feeding into infant satiety, I don't know, but I think that's another likely, you know, plausible way in which moms are perceiving increased demand from infants in more stressed environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, could you just expand a little bit on um, uh, the degree to which mixed uh, feeding patterns interact with um, ovulatory suppression? Mm -hmm. I know that you mentioned that you didn't see um, a decline, at least in, in this sample, in the um, duration or frequency of breastfeeding bouts, and did that translate to also no difference in ovulatory suppression? Yeah, at least in terms of when moms report resumption, of cycling, there was no relationship between the duration of exclusive breastfeeding. For the Chimani moms, uh, average or the average time to post resumption of postpartum menstruation is 14 months. Um, my colleague Claudia Valacia has done this more extensively with the Calm with the Toba previously. Their average uh, time to postpartum resumption of menses was about 10 months. Um, and so she uh, really, she and Peter Ellison really pioneered the metabolic load hypothesis, which is the understanding that breastfeeding frequency matters in terms of the continual hormonal signaling and feedback that suppresses ovulation, but so does the relative cost of, me uh, the relative cost of the, of lactation, so that, um, meaning, even at very intensive breastfeeding, if you're always able to continually replace those calories lost uh, with other foods, as happens particularly in our society when you can just like drink a giant latte with whipped cream and replace those calories, um, it's a relatively lower metabolic load. And so that's another signal that's feeding into that hormonal feedback and you can start resuming ovulation sooner when you're more calorically stressed, either because of access to food or high energy demands, um, that, that relative metabolic load of lactation is gonna be higher and cycling will be longer. And we certainly see that in the US, I think even among exclusively breastfeeding mothers, the average resumption of 
uh, menstruation postpartum is like six months or less. Yeah, Sam. Um, I'm, I'm deeply offended by your claim that ours is a society which is no room for new Outside of these rooms. So my comments are all, I think, things that are that you touched on that are maybe implicit in your presentation, mm -hmm. maybe you thought about them already. Um, but that build on it. So you, in, in talking about reverse causality, you sort of present these two possible explanations for the correlation, right? But an, an, another way of thinking about it is that maybe there is a, maybe there's a sweet spot that the Jamani are hitting, which is that the mixed feeding actually accelerates growth without, um, it, 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 without supplanting, as you said, but in such a way that the accelerated growth increases demand they're, they're just below the mm -hmm. threshold where the demand on lactation is never reduced. Yeah. So, so there isn't any um, there isn't any anovulation or um, reduction in mm -hmm. frequency of, of um, demand and so on. And there, I'm very sensitive to your um, your call for more immediate biological outcome measures, but it strikes me that. Um, you could imagine a life history system in which it's sensitive to the uh, that tipping point, mm -hmm. as it were, right? such that if the if the supplementary foods are sufficient in frequency, caloric content, etc., that can actually be taken by the system as a signal of reduction in maternal investment. Yeah. Yeah. which would accelerate life history trajectory, which would lead to what, you know, our contemporary medical science sees as poor outcomes. Mm -hmm. right? um, uh, but it wouldn't lead to those necessarily directly because of the proximate consequences of right. the, say, the, you know, simple sugars that are being presented in the obesogenic supplementary foods as much as, I'm, I'm not yeah. discounting that, but as much as it is because the system is taking that as a cue of um, faster life history trajectory necessity, and that that will have, necessarily have negative long-term outcomes, right, because there's lower investment in, in maintenance and growth and so on. So um, I, while I'm sympathetic to your call for, you know, basing recommendations on the on the basis of, of more immediate measures, I don't think you should rule out looking at things like, you know, diabetes risk and so on later in life as potentially a consequence of getting that tipping point wrong yeah. and, um, and, and there being a signal in there. And relatedly, so you talked about the supplementary foods as, um, uh, you know, potentially a pathogen risk. You talked about the pathogen environment. Um, we talked about the protective functions of breastfeeding with regard to those pathogens. Another kind of sweet spot explanation would be that um, that there's developmental calibration of the immune system to the local pathogen ecology, and that the combination of mixed feeding, especially in a poor hygiene <coughs> environment, and breastfeeding is actually optimal, not just because of the the calories being presented by the dual pathways, but also because the mixed eating is itself a source of pathogens to which the immune system can calibrate while sheltered by um, maternal breast milk yeah. the antibodies therein. And likewise, the mixed feeding may be optimizing microbiome, infant microbiome, because especially if there's pre-mastication, for example, mm -hmm. or there are prebiotics in mm -hmm. the mixed feeding, right? That there's a developmental advantage to mixed eating. So the Chimani might have just nailed it, right? And, and, and I mean, there's no reason to put them on a pedestal for doing so mm -hmm. any more than to deprecate the mm -hmm. Icelandic, you know, 17th century folks for, I mean, cultural evolution can get stuck at high optima and low yeah. optima, right? And those are both examples of that. Um, but they might have nailed it for their particular ecology where they're providing the right prebiotics, they're, they're you know, we get low, lower mortality, infant mortality rates when they have, you know, adequate um, 
uh, immunocalibration under the umbrella of breast milk. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, and um, and I, I do want to emphasize that yes, I don't think that the Chimani are necessarily a model for many other populations because things can so easily go in the wrong direction in terms of um, relying too much on mixed feeding that would offset breast milk production, um, and also maybe really risky uh, complementary foods. Um, I, I didn't bring up the immunocalibration model, but I think that is an important, um, it's an important piece, um, both related to, as you mentioned, with premastication and the, the types of foods that might be prebiotics and probiotics, which the Chimani, that is part of their complementary feeding repertoire. Um, but also we, there's more and more evidence coming out in, among research in the US and, and Europe about how important um, energetically minimal but anagenic exposure to things like peanuts and and these very highly um, um, pro-inflammatory and kind of allergenic foods um, that can be modulated by early exposure for the infant so direct exposure and at the same time being um, kind of under the protective influence of breastfeeding at the same time so there there definitely I think seems to be a window at which it's more than um, just protective and energetic effects, but yes, there's a whole signaling environment of what that you're getting through breast milk and through complementary foods of what the what the environment is and how you need to calibrate metabolic responses to it optimally and immunological responses uh, optimally as well. And I would also, you know, agree with your your point um, about the long-term outcomes and and. Yeah, I don't mean to dismiss them. I just more want to emphasize that there has to be both. Like, there's reasons for expecting maybe higher obesity or diabetes risk later on, um, but I think there also has to be more emphasis on the pathways which that happen because maybe it is signaling, um, and maybe it is also, or maybe it is the quality of or you know uh, composition of certain foods. So we need to be able to test both of those because that should inform really optimal practice for, for any individual. Yeah, so just to follow up briefly, I mean, it seems to me, um, so looking at, say, you know, stature or something like that, right, it, it is, a, is a poor mm -hmm. dependent variable because it conflates yeah. adequacy of the supply with, um, with lower investment in, in growth relative to reproduction. And looking at something like age of sexual maturation is a better <laughs> because it, it allows you to disentangle those, right? Because yeah. poorly nourished individuals do not mature early, but you know, fast life history trajectory individuals do. Right, right, yeah. And we, you know, that's actually a, a next step for the Colm research, hopefully, is um, following up with the infants that were in the study who are all about age seven to 10 right now, um, at least to see their growth trajectories right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned how, like, um, uh, about the stigma and all that. It was very interesting, and um, uh, and some of the stigma, or at least some of the the, the um, justification of it of, of non breastfeeding stigma against uh, non breastfeeders uh, is about the idea that you're like replacing the calories that would come from breast milk with something else, and that will you know, disrupt this feedback and stuff. But what about um, replacement foods or supplementary foods, whatever you call it, that are uh, like water and tea seem to be really common in Latin American mm -hmm. cultures, um, especially. And so I was wondering, like, whether the the idea of like the replacement being totally non-caloric yeah. has any meaning, or whether you found these effects differently, you know, depending whether it was water and tea versus anything else. Uh, yeah, I. I haven't looked at that with the Chimani. They don't give water or tea. That they give is chicha, which is a just like mixed boiled manioc or corn beverage mixed with water. Um, and they give soup broth. Um, but I mean, I would just say from what I know of at least uh, like breastfeeding advice blogs on the internet and stuff, uh, anything that is, yeah, like any water, 
or juice, and I think even in the, the World Health Organization recommendations, those are considered as, as interfering or possibly undermining uh, breastfeeding because of the volume, maybe, and just the suckling, but not, not the calories. But I don't know, you know how much that's really been tested. Where, where there have been more studies about, um, about the quality of complementary foods hasn't even been with liquids. It's been with other, like if you give more fat-dense or protein-dense complementary foodings, does that seem to offset feeding uh, earlier or offset more breast milk production? I've seen studies like that, but not looking at tea you, or water. Would you like suspect that I don't know, just biologically, <coughs> like if you fill a baby's tiny little tummy with a bunch of water, like will that actually interfere with its hunger response and desire to suckle? I I don't know. It certainly doesn't interfere with mine. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> yeah. Um, everything that you've learned from your own research and what you know, um, what what do you think the implications are of this um, three month? a maternity leave that we have built into our system now. It doesn't match up with the six month recommended um, minimum for 100% breastfeeding. Um, what do you think of public health? Yeah. I mean, part of why I try and tread so cautiously in talking about any of this is because I think that like a recommendation and a policy towards six months of exclusive breastfeeding can help promote six months of paid maternity and paternity leave for anybody because if you need to breastfeed for six months exclusively, you need to be able to be with your child or you know, as a, as a partner also helping uh, out in ways so that the mother can always be, a nursing mother can be with their child. Um, so I, I think that there's a way to stress that you need frequent suckling to maintain breastfeeding um, and keep the, you know, the average of six months as this is a window at which um, you know, we want to provide the opportunity for everybody to be able to achieve that. Now, individually, maybe it could be, you know, some infants may be earlier or later on that trajectory, but um, recognizing just the importance of continued frequent and constant contact and nursing as being vital to just establishing breastfeeding and continuing breastfeeding over a long period of time. I mean, minimally, I think, yeah, you absolutely do need three months. I've, I know this more from my own experiences <laughs> breastfeeding than anything from the literature, is to, um, there's a lot of problems that one might encounter early on, and if you had to go back earlier than three months, if you had to go back to work and be gone from your infant for a long period of time, um, that, that can certainly immediately derail, I think, uh, just overall breastfeeding, not necessarily, and, and that's more of my, I think my argument is just we can reframe the whole, the everything to just focus on what helps anybody breastfeed for as long as they possibly can, not just what is good for exclusive breastfeeding for any amount of time. Um, but I, I do think that they're they're important and they're connected and we shouldn't lose sight of that. If I could just follow up very briefly, it seems to me that this is a case where there are direct policy implications for being able to investigate the life history trajectory possibility, right? Because mm -hmm. if, I mean, if you think about it, it's pretty odd that, and, and, and I'm not questioning your experience, I know lots of people, including my own family, had similar experiences, but, it, but it's kind of odd that a mammal has such a delicate, you know, process where it's like so easily perturbed and baby doesn't mm -hmm. do the right thing and mother doesn't do their, I mean, it's kind of odd for a mammal, right? So, I mean, there, there are two explanations for that. One is that the environment is so novel now that, you know, we can just throw a wrench in things and break them badly and that, that this is just, you know, what, what, what happens when babies fail to nurse properly or mothers you know, uh, fail in breastfeeding, right? But another possibility is that, no, actually the system is just exquisitely calibrated to a bunch of cues, and 
mom not being there with breast when hungry, right, is a cue. Mm -hmm. And instead of, you know, investing a whole lot in trying to obtain what isn't going to be forthcoming, just changing the trajectory at that point is going to be a strategy that you would expect in a ball system to have. If that's the case, then there are big public policy implications here if, you know, by failing to allow women to have, you know, work arrangements and home life arrangements in which they are nursing for prolonged periods and not even just pumping, but actually nursing, you know, we're creating huge societal costs by fast-tracking people onto a faster life history trajectory mm -hmm. when our society as a whole and its values and its health system is all about a soul. So it, it seems to me that that's, that attention should be devoted to that issue. Yeah. Okay. So, Kate and I just have a paper and review on this topic. But I would say, I would just add, I think, that the, the issue often gets focused on leave and the amount of time for leave. And, I, and that certainly is one piece of the puzzle. But the other weird thing about humans is that, sort of similar to what you were saying, is that we don't necessarily know how to do it. It's not just the, the perturbing the system, but actually figuring out how to get a baby to latch is something that we as mammals struggle with a lot compared to most other mammals. And that, you can give a, a woman all the time that she wants, but if she doesn't have a support system there to be able to help her figure that out, then the time in and of itself is not enough. You need, you need something else other than the time going on. Now, so there's variation, right, in how much women struggle, but I think that that's a, a big piece of the puzzle that often gets lost when we're just focusing on this sort of, it's like six months exclusive breastfeeding, this month, amount, this amount of time for leave, right? It, it, those are easy things, I think, to think about in terms of what the policy should be, but there, I think, are, are more complicated pieces to the puzzle that need to be worked out as well, and that are have gotten lost as we've gotten so separated from our support systems. Yeah, and so Brooke's research with the HIMBA has directly shown, and it's something that I wish I would have known to talk to Chamani moms about, about that early process of figuring out breastfeeding and how much support, um, you know, especially first-time moms, I would assume, need from their mothers and, you know, other women around them. And while that might seem weird as a mammal, I think it also, it has antecedents in other aspects of our biology, like birth and the fact that we have supported births. Um, and, and even maybe related to the whole life history strategy in that when you see uh, when there also are a lot of problems with latch could signal something about the, you know, the quality, so to speak, of the infant. Um, and, you know, and that's something to, I think, keep in mind in not conflating anything as, you know, natural fallacy type thing that we, we can do a lot more for very weak, vulnerable, premature infants who can't latch properly, and that's something uh, to be aware of and, and celebrate that we have the ability to do that, whereas those infants would have suffered and, and died previously. I, I think the, your point work is a parallel one, and, and, and I agree entirely with the ethical point. Um, but the, the, the reliance on teaching learning Right? And, and having co-evolved with altriciality as, as part of our whole system of you know, high encephalization and reliance on cultural transmission, I, that, it seems to me, is somewhat separate than the delicacy of the nursing lactation system, right? That they're related, and I agree with you that, that I mean, so all primiparous primates have high, you know, mm -hmm. Neonatal mortality rates, and probably they're learning some too. But you know, their babies don't choke to death if they don't hold their heads up right the way that ours do, right? So I mean, obviously, there, there's a, our system is built on a lot more cultural transmission as part of the neonatal care. It's not clear to me that the ease with which lactation itself, as opposed to the acts of breastfeeding and the procedures involved in that, the ease with which that gets interrupted in our system, right? That that, that is the same thing. The right? supply right. issue. Yeah, the yeah. supply issue. I think those two things are yeah. related but separate. And and there is a good amount of research too, I, more so focusing, you know, even in our own population, not on the biobehavioral and learning 
issue, but supply that is related to interference from, um, you know, glucose metabolism problems and, and obesity and how breasts, large breasts structurally are more difficult for infants to latch onto and, and things like that, that um, we also have to, to keep in mind as in our very real but novel problems making that whole process more difficult. Okay, I think we're just about out of time. Thank you.